We are in Genesis chapter 3, and this is that, um, that interesting chapter to where sin begins in humanity in this chapter. The events that are going to transpire, they're going to cause our forefather and our foremother, our very first father and our very first mother, to sin occur in this chapter. Now, folks, last week I made fun about us uh, studying by the pound, and I must apologize because this week's lesson is actually four pages longer than last week's lesson. So I'm going to encourage you to read through it uh, sometime through the week to get things that I'm going to pass up because in order for us to get through we're and get through in a timely manner, I need for us to uh, skip over some of the things but hit the most important things. I hope you enjoy. I enjoy having this marker board behind me. I have used it all these years, and I just figured out last night that it's actually a magnetic board also. Nobody puts instructions out that if you put a magnet on this board, so I'm looking for some good magnets so I don't have to use tape in the future. But I, it, it's, um, I wish it was a flannel board. Did any of y'all use flannel boards when you were growing up? The first time I remember talking about this lesson in Chapter 3, uh, I was in Mangum, Oklahoma, and my teacher... Uh, was uh, putting up little pictures of Adam and Eve and the snake and everything on a flannel board, and she could move them around. I can't move these around, so they are, are pre-put up there for you. And if you'll notice, right in the middle of the board, I have a, a learning example for us. Right in the middle of the board, I have two pictures. Two pictures. Now, through this lesson, we're finally going to get to the point where I'm going to ask you about these two pictures. Now, I want you to look at them very carefully because there is something majorly different about these two pictures. It's big. It is big. Do you see it yet? I don't know if you see it yet. Wait a minute. I'm not going to, don't, I'm not going to answer you yet, okay? But I, want, I want everybody to see if they can find out what is di the difference between these two two pictures because it's an important point. Remember, in this study of going through Genesis, we're taking a different direction than all the other commentators of um, commentators. Sounds like French fried taters and all that kind of stuff. The, con the people who, Idaho potatoes, that's right. Um, all the other commentators, uh, uh, biblical scholars, uh, we tend to always go at what's going on in the story with man. But really, we're looking at what God's doing. Throughout the entire book of Genesis, we're going to look at what is God doing. Where is God? Why is He not interacting? Why is He interacting at this point? All the way through the study. Because it tells us so much about God and how God will react in our lives. Listen, things are going to come out in this lesson today with God and how He treats us and how He... Uh, uh, interacts in our lives that has not changed with us, did not change with Adam and Eve, and will not, did not change with any of the children, and will not change with you. When you sin, God is going to do the same thing with you that He did with Adam and Eve. And so, as we look at this, we, we have to wonder about sin. It, it, there's always the question, uh, did sin exist before Adam and Eve uh, were created. Was evil created before Adam and Eve were created? And in fact, I have heard teachers in the past say, God's eyes are too holy to look upon sin. And what they're doing is they're quoting out of, out of Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 3, where Habakkuk is offering a prayer Actually, the people are trying to get Habakkuk to offer a prayer to God, the Lord Jehovah, because the Assyrians are attacking the northern kingdom and going to take it into exile. And the context of Habakkuk 3.3 is, Surely God's eyes are too pure and holy to look upon this sin of the Assyrians coming in to take us into exile. And the true answer is, is God is sending the Assyrians 
to take them over and to take them into exile. So here in this lesson, we have to understand that evil was created before Adam. All things were created by God, by the Lord Jehovah. All things were created. In fact, the scripture in last week's lesson that I read to you in support of this tells us that all things were created by God and nothing was created that was not created by God. God created everything, the good and the bad. And like these pictures that are behind me, there's something different in those pictures. There's something different in some of the things that God created. Some of the things that God created were good in one instance and bad in another instance. God has chosen to create things that He says to the people who love Him and follow Him and choose Him, these things are holy and righteous and I want you to do them. And you are free to do them. These things over here, I'm considering evil and sin. Why in the world did God create evil and sin in His plan of creation? We don't find it this early in the book of Genesis, but believe me, we don't have to go far in Genesis on down the road before it's going to be revealed. And then it's going to be unpacked even more as we go all the way to the book of Revelation. God wanted to create beings that had the ability to communicate with Him that would choose Him or reject Him. Humans are not the only ones that He gave that ability to. He gave that ability to the angels also. They had the ability to stay faithful to Him, or they also had the ability to sin. So was evil created before Adam and Eve? I can prove that to you without going very far. Right here in this lesson. Right, actually in last week's lesson. When he planted the garden in last week's lesson, in the garden he, he put two special trees. One was a tree of life. The other was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So do we have to ask the question, did evil exist before Adam? It had to because the tree was planted there for Adam not to eat of that tree because in the day that he ate of that tree... He would know the difference between good and evil. It was all part of God's plan. When I get to heaven one day, I'm going to ask God if I'm brave enough and big enough. I'm not going to be brave enough and I'm not going to be big enough, so I'm not going to ask God. But I would like to ask God, why did you plan it this way? Why? And even though I know the answer, He wanted a people who would choose Him that He could bless. And to those who do not choose Him, do not follow His instructions, then there's another plan for those. It's all part of God's plan. Now, could sin be imported into this world that we know? It didn't have to be imported, imported into this by the snake or by anybody. Sin was planted in this world by God. It was planted, the ability to sin and to know what sin was, was planted in the garden so that man could partake of it. Did Adam and Eve have the ability to sin when they were created? Absolutely. So were the angels. Did Adam and Eve know what sin was when they were created? Probably not. Did they live some time of their lives without knowing what sin was? Probably yes. They live for a period of time. Not knowing. Because the thing that's going to tell them what sin is, is when they partake of that fruit, of that tree. And so, we have to ask the question also, could the, could the old serpent that we're going to talk about here in a minute cause Adam and Eve to sin? No. Could he make them sin? No. All he could do was tempt them to sin. And by the way, all the way through to the book of James, which actually explains it the best in the first chapter, and going on down to the book of Revelation. Satan cannot make you do anything, folks. The only thing Satan can do is hang something out in front of you and tempt you with it, and then you have to make the choice. Now, God knows what choice you're going to make. Foreknowledge does not mean 
Uh, the foreknowledge of God does not mean that God is going to make you do something. He's going to allow you to have a choice. He knows what choice you're going to make, but He still allows you to make the choice. Because He wants a people who will choose Him. A people who will be faithful to Him. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. See the word beast? See the word beast there? He's not talking about cattle. He's not talking about creeping things, as was in last week's lesson. But he's talking about beast. That was in last week's lesson also. The three types of creatures that he's talking about. Cattle, creeping things, beast. Beast, if you remember, the Hebrew word means meat eaters. Beast, meat eaters. So he says, this serpent was the most craftiest of all the meat-eating animals, is what it's saying here. You read between the lines to find that by catching the definitions of the Hebrew words. Of any of all the other beasts of the field, of all the other meat-eaters, this serpent was the craftiest. Now, listen, you have to ask the question here. Were serpents able to communicate with Adam and Eve? No, that is true. God, ooh, I love it when you get it. Yes. How come you older folks were so slow? Because it takes longer to process. I love that. She took a coffee cup and did it around her head like she was blessing it and pouring it or something. That's, it, get them synapses working a whole lot quicker. You okay? No. Was, what, what was the deal about that? What? What, what in the world is, is going on with an animal being able to communicate verbally, talk, speak to Eve? Well, the, okay, devil, that is, a good, that is a good answer. Listen, actually I'm going to alter these notes just a little bit before I put them uh, up uh, this week on the website because I didn't cover one, 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 one issue here. This serpent snake, I've, I've drawn a picture. In other words, I had way too much time on my hands <laughs> between classes, okay? Um, because the first class only got the snake and y'all got the tree too. Uh, that just came up later. All right. This snake that's in this, this beast that's curled on this branch on this tree was able to speak to Eve. Now, uh, there are two options of what took place in this. Angels have the ability to come into this creation sent by God and present themselves as real creatures. Two angels plus the angel Lord will come to Abraham later on down in this Genesis story. Abraham will see them as they are real men, really people there, but they're not. They are angels. They have not possessed the body of anyone. They have appeared to look like men by coming and, and, and uh, doing so. But they're not really men. They're angels. They're spirits. So that could be one example of this serpent. This serpent is not a real serpent. It is the soul serpent, the dragon, the guy we call Satan, the demon who's fallen, who is presenting himself as if he is a snake. He's not really a snake, but he's presenting himself as he is this snake. That's one possibility. The other possibility is this is a real snake, and Satan has possessed that snake. You follow me? And it's going to be one of the two. Do we know which one? We don't know which one. You are good. Number two, right. Number three, she's going to get her certificate of graduation before the rest of y'all. Graduation, all right. All right, now, so one of two issues happens here. It's one of those two things. Either it is the serpent proposing as the snake or it is a snake that the serpent has possessed. Whichever way, it does not matter. So this, this serpent is crafty. By the way, the word serpent in Hebrew is really our word hiss. Adam named the serpent because of what the serpent did. So Hiss came, we know the name of the serpent. It's Hiss. Hiss came, well, that's, 
means serpent. Hiss came to Eve to talk to Eve, and she was this hiss, this serpent was more cunning than all the other beasts. That means he was able to communicate because all the other beasts, the meat eaters, or the cattle, or the creeping things, are not able to communicate this way. That's the reason why this serpent is far more cunning more uh, uh, than all the other. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1b, on page 34. And he said to the woman, this is the hiss, the snake, Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The serpent is saying to Eve, we don't know her name is Eve yet, but I've made the mistake of adding it because we're going to get it in the chapter. Uh, the word her, is really here. He says to the woman, the woman's name is Isha. Isha. I've put it up there. I've drawn a man and a woman. A man is an Ish. A woman is an Isha. Ish means male. Isha means female or came from male. Okay. Isha is what that means. He says to the Isha, God has said you cannot eat or should not eat or will not eat or cannot eat or better not eat from any of the trees of the garden. He has, he has made an incorrect statement to the woman. Has he done this be, with ignorance because he doesn't know what the Lord has said to the woman? No. The answer is no. No, he knows. He knows. He is trying to find out, I believe, uh, what the woman knows and what Adam has said to her. What does she know about this? Well, verse 2 says, And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. So she's saying, no, no, no. No, we can eat of these trees. We can eat of these trees. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. We have a problem with that because she has misquoted Adam. If we go back to Genesis chapter 2, the Lord told Adam that he is not to eat from the tree or he shall die. Eve, the woman, has added or touch it to the phrase. She has misquoted Adam. Now we have to ask the question. Did Adam misquote God? Well, maybe. He's a man. We, had God told the woman the instruction, it would have been right all the way down the line. It's just the nature of women, isn't it? Yeah. I'm trying to get in good with y'all, so I hope this works, all right? It's working, right? But he told the man, and the man told the woman, and now it's like gossip in that the story's changing by the time it got to the woman. Satan does not pick up on the words or touch it. He ignores that because he's got something else he wants to say. So he knows now that she hasn't got the message correctly. So he is going to be able to use what she's not sure about to bring doubt into her life. Verse 4, And the serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. How does Satan know that God knows that in the day she eats from the fruit, that she will be like God and know the things of God, and her eyes will be open? Because this serpent is not just a regular serpent. This serpent has stood, as we find out in the rest of the Bible, has stood in the presence of God as the chief of all the angels, the head of all of them. And he's chosen, to, he's chosen that position, and he's the one who decided that he, did, he wanted his name to be as great as that of God. I have trouble with that, just as a side note. I should not chase this rabbit in this lesson. But you will rarely hear me name the name of Satan. Uh, the quartet and the things that Rex is in the quartet in here with us today still. And, and the quartet, we will never sing a song that mentions the name of Satan or anything like that in it. Because I do not want to name his name in anything that we're singing with glory to God. I do not like those songs. That's just a side note from me. Okay, In fact, there is one song 
that I am trying to figure out how to reword the words of a song so I can get it out of it because I love the song, but there's just one part of it. Now, I can probably get Rex to rewrite it for me, and, but, but then I have problems with that too because in that, that can be a sin also. So I don't want to... I don't want to be a sinner. Remember, I remind all of y'all, before you go out of here, please do not try to sin before 1 o'clock uh, when you leave. All right? So here, but what has the woman said here? What has Satan said to the woman? He says, surely. Now, commentators, English commentators, make a big deal out about that, about that word surely. The one thing they don't tell you is the word surely is not in the original. So you can go back and make a huge deal out of it. The way you say, oh, you surely won't die. To emphasize, it's not there. It's not in the original. Thank you, William Tyndall, for putting it in back in the 1500s with the very first translation. It was a word that he added to add emphasis, but it's not there. Actually, the Hebrew is really just three words. Die, not die. In other words... Uh, dying, you will not die. Or in dying, you will not die by eating of this, this food. Dying, not die. In other words, you're gonna, it actually helps the theology better than hurting the theology by realizing it's not there. In your process of going towards death, you will not die immediately. The answer to our question, why didn't she die immediately? Because that's not what's being said there. What's being said is, she will know good and evil and she will begin the process of dying. And it's Satan who gives us the correct theology. Satan always does that. Satan always gives us just enough truth to hook us in. And then we accept all the falseness he piles on top of it. Because we've been hooked in to the truth. Well, he wanted... Uh, we want to conclude that the serpent was indicating to Eve that in the moment that she ate, she wouldn't die. She wouldn't die a physical death. Now, I have to ask the question. Did Eve know about death? Did Eve know about death? You don't think so? Do you think she had never seen a beast, a carnivorous animal that was built that way, created that way to eat, not eat another animal until that point? If you are built to be a meat eater, you're going to eat. Now, probably, not probably, surely, she had seen animals, how they eat. How the, whether they eat vegetation or they eat other animals, she had seen the process. But she had not, at this point in time, seen death, the death of another individual human being. Did she know the word death? Absolutely. Because the instruction was, in the day that you eat of the fruit, you will die. So she heard the word. Did she know about evil? Had to know about evil because the name of the tree they're walking around has the name evil in it. Did she know about sin? She knew about sin, but, and why? Because the tree she's walking around in the midst of the garden where they're living has the name sin, a word sin in the name. But does she truly understand the reality and the concept of what we know as evil and sin and death? I don't think she does. In fact, humans have not changed in that at all. We humans will pick up an odd words here and there and we will use it forever, never even knowing what it means. And when we find out what it means, we go, oh. And we're appalled. Appalled. Give you an example, but do not be offended by this. Gee. Do we know where that came from? Mule skinners. <laughs> Mule skinners. No. No. It comes from a blasphemous use of the word Jesus. Gee. Okay? It's, it's J-E-S. Yes, yeah, yeah, J-E-E, -E, yeah. It's a shortened for form of the blasphemous name of using Jesus like we use, you know, 
You've heard people say, please not to be offended at this. I'm just giving you an example. Jesus Christ. Okay, you got it? It's coming from that. It's not what we're saying. It's the way we're saying it and the way we're using it. You understand that? Boy, that is going to be major when I turn back and look at these pictures for y'all in just a little bit. Because I just gave you a clue what's different about these two pictures. I just gave you a major clue. Is there anything wrong with the fruit on either of those trees? No. The fruit looks exactly alike, doesn't it? Yes. But is there something different about those trees? Yes. Can I get to that in just a minute? Jeez, uh, the serpent. Boy, I've got y'all going, don't I? Just wait till I get down to the fig leaves. You're going to love that. Well, what's more important is that the serpent has said, For God knows. God knows that the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. Are they going to be like God? Are they going to be able to create? No. What, are they, what does he know? What does Satan know that's going to happen when they eat of the fruit and their eyes are open? They're going to know about evil and sin. And that's being like God because God created the things that He said, these are good and holy. And He created the things that He says, these things, my people that I have chosen, who choose me, who want to be with me, who will worship and adore me, these are going to be evil, sinful things for them. We would not have known that had it not been for Paul. We have to put two and two together on this. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1-4, through 4, Paul refers to this passage when he's explaining what happens with false teachers um, coming and trying to teach in the church, the Corinthian church, the Christian Corinthian church. He says, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness. In other words, he's going back and going to play a little game with this and use something that's really foolish that happened for an example. But indeed, you are bearing for it with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, that is to Christ. I, ma- I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid. Now, Corinthians, listen. The church at Corinth, the first and second letter to Corinthians, that church, is that church had the most problems of all that first century churches. And the, everything in First and Second Corinthians is about trying to correct things that are going wrong in that church. He says, I am afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity of, and purity of devotion to Christ. How? I'm putting the word how in there. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. He says, I'm afraid that a preacher is going to preach a different gospel to you, and yet they're going to say something that is truthful and deceive you and pull you in, and you'll bear it beautifully. Paul is letting us know that that's what happened to Eve. Serpent comes in. He knows what she knows. He even knows a little bit more what she knows. What he's telling her is wrong, but yet what he's also telling us, part of it's right. Because in the day that that she eats, she will know what God knows about good and evil. She's not going to be like God. She's going to be like God in knowing good and evil, but she's not going to be like God and be able to create anything. So that old serpent, that old dragon, that old, that old Satan, he's done all he can do with Eve. All he can do is just take that possibility and hang it out there in front of her and say, look, look, this is for you. Sure, this is going to be good for you. Do it. But he can't make her do it. He can't grab the fruit. He can't open her mouth. He can't put it in there. He can't force her to bite it. He can't do any of that. She has to reach out and want it. And as the book of James says, lust after it. Uh, And so verse 6a says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, because she wanted to be wise, she took from it and she ate. 
Let's just pretend these were the two trees that were there in the garden. And this one was in the midst. And this one was just over to the side. In fact, this one had multiples just like it all the way around. And Eve could eat of all of those around. But she couldn't eat of this one. But she looks at it and it meets all the criteria of being a tree that she should be able to eat from. From the chapter before when God explained what kind of trees she could eat from and what kind of other vegetation they could eat. And it meets all the criteria. And it meets the criteria this one met. And for all practical purposes, the trees may have been identical. Okay, you're looking at the pictures. Do you see what's different? Can you see it? No. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. What do you think it is? Has nothing to do with that. Anyone else want to try? Yes, ma'am. One's good and one's evil. Maybe, maybe not. What? Hang on a second. I'm going to grab it to you. Yes, sir. And they are. It, no, but this is the, this is, we're pretending here. This is the tree of, could be a tree of knowledge. She could eat of that tree, by the way. This is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Okay. Yes, sir. Now, what was your, one is forbidden. Okay? Has nothing to do with the tree. Has nothing to do with the tree. It has to do with the instruction of the Creator. This one, with all the rest, you may partake of all of it. You can eat everything on this tree. This one, you are not to eat anything. Let me give you an example of that because this example is not going to change in the Lord's instruction to us. Remember earlier I talked about God created everything and some things in certain situations He says these things are holy and righteous and loving and correct. And in other circumstances, let me fill in the between the lines now, those same things because of the Lord's command, not because of the thing they are ugly, they are wicked, they are holy. Let me give you an example, a quick one. Ish and Isha, male and female, find each other and fall in love. Ish and Isha, male and female, go down to the little white church on the corner. They stand before the minister with rings and they make vows before God. That they're going to love each other until death do them part. And the minister says, it is my privilege and my honor. By the power invested in me by the state of Texas. And by the power invested in me by the Lord Jesus Christ as a minister of the gospel. I pronounce you husband and wife. And they leave that altar. And they go do the things that lead to babies. You got the point? It is pure. It is holy. It is righteous. It is godly. It is perfect. It is fulfillment of God's plan. It is absolutely the most wonderful thing in the world for a couple. And it's God's design. Okay, let's step over a little bit. We have Ish. And we have Isha. And they've met. And they've fallen in love. But they don't want to do it God's way. They just, that very first night, go start doing the things that make babies. To that, the scripture and God says, that is evil, that is wicked, that is out of my will, that is not my plan, and that is sin. It has nothing to do with the fruit. It has nothing to do with the bodies. It has nothing to do with the things that make you male or make you female. Am I being delicate about this? Okay, I am, but you get the point. 
It has nothing to do with that stuff. It has to do with the command that comes around it. It's about what God wants and how to proceed in those events. The same event that can be godly and holy in one circumstance done right is evil and sin when done wrong. You got it? This tree that says it's the knowledge of good and evil probably looked no different than any of the other trees. The reality, the tree right next to it probably had the same or could have had the same form of leaves, the same fruit hanging off of it, everything. The issue was this one was in the midst of the garden so they would know that that's the one they were not to partake of. Follow me? Okay, so now we have a problem. She took that fruit and she ate it. Verse 6b, And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. It's not enough that she sinned. She likes the taste of this fruit. She takes it and shares it because it's delicious. She's seen it. She's looked at it. Does she know good and evil yet? Uh-uh. No. We, we, that's the next verse, okay? We're not there yet. And she gave it to her husband. Why? He's her best friend. And he ought to be. It's the way marriages are supposed to be. It's the way Ish and Ishah's ought to be. They ought to be your best friend of each other. Ought to be. 7a. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. When? When both of them had partaken. And they knew that they were naked. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So, is nakedness a sin? No, it's not a sin. Nakedness is not a sin. You're born naked. You're basically going to die naked. Okay? I mean, underneath all those clothes that you have on, you are naked. It's just the way it is. Have I embarrassed anybody yet? Y'all still with me? Anybody want me to end the lesson and we leave? Here we go. You're not going to find out the rest of it? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely, is the one in the what she brought it to him, and you know how much women talk. Oh, I just lost some of my what I was trying to do a while ago. I don't know that answer. We do not know that answer. Okay. Okay. We must not miss the nature of sin. It's interesting. Once sin has occurred, and all of y'all know about sin because all of y'all are sinners. Once you do something that you know is a sin, that you've broken an instruction, you immediately should feel shame. And you do. For what you've done. You should immediately know that what you have done is wrong and it is a sin against God. We should immediately seek a remedy for our sin. That's what we should do and that's what we always try to do. The question really is, how do you go about getting that remedy? Do you try to handle it and fix it on your own? Or do you the, go to the one that can forgive you and remedy it for you? What do Adam and Eve do? Well, here's what they do. 7b. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Okie dokie. We know what part of them they were covering because of one word in that sentence that is in the Hebrew. I wish it wasn't, but it is. Because I like to think that they made a whole ball gown out of fig leaves to cover her, all of her. But they did not cover all of her or all of him. They only just covered certain parts of him, them each, each other. They covered the loin parts. For you, those of you who do not know where the loin parts are, I have drawn a diagram for you. Ish and Isha. You only get this here. I'm not sure John, Chuck, or Stuart would ever draw such pictures. Fig leaf coverings covered the loin areas. Made to cover their differences. Did you catch it? They covered their differences. Wait a minute. I have show and tell. 
Would anyone like to try them on? Now, everybody's always worried about fig leaves and that they're so scratchy. Did you know that they're only scratchy on the top side and not on the bottom? So actually, it probably was not that bad. Um, and if you had an itch, you could just flip one over. And it would work. There are several trees in our scripture that are called fig trees. The one that is being used here is the one that is closest to our modern day figs because the leaves were large and the branches were soft and able to you could take them and you could weave them into something to weave around you and let them hang down to cover that which was different in you the isha from the ish now I wonder did Adam make these or did Eve make these I, I don't think we know Maybe they made each other's, huh? And the question is, I'm headed that way. You're good. How long did it take for them to figure out, what are we going to do? What are we going to By the way, the other fig tree is the, what we call really today, we call it a sycamore tree. It's the fig tree that Zacchaeus climbed up into to see Jesus as he walked by. It has little leaves about that size, and the branches are very strong okay but this one the branches are malleable so they can be woven into place so with this I have to ask the question how long which is the question you brought up how long did it take for them to think up what they were going to use to cover themselves number one number two is they had never had to think like that before, so this was really stretching their brain power. Number three is, how long did it take for them to get it done? But my big question is, is where was God? Where was God? This is very, yes, he heard everything and he was watching. But from Adam and Eve's standpoint, where is God? Nothing has changed with God about this to this day. When you sin and you do something wrong, this is what God is going to do. He is going to wait. He is always going to wait. Do you know why He's waiting? He's waiting to see what you are going to do. Are you going to run to Him to seek forgiveness? Are you going to try to cover up your sin on your own? When David got Bathsheba pregnant with child, and, the, and it came out that she was pregnant by, with child. By the way, you do realize that that didn't happen. They didn't find out the next day. It took some time for them to find out. And then what did David do? Did he run to God to ask for forgiveness? No. He called in the husband and tried to get him to go be with his wife and the husband wouldn't go. So the next night he gets him drunk and sin, tries to send him to his wife and that doesn't work either. He lays out on the doorstep. Finally, he sends him back into battle with another to tell the general to have him killed in the heat of the battle. What is David doing? Nothing different than what Adam did in this case. Sin is sin is sin is sin. Adam tried to fix it. Eve tried to fix it. David tried to fix it. The, the very person they should have run to, they run away from and they hide. Next page. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Okay, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. But the word cool is not the word that is used in the Hebrew context to mean the cool of the day. It's the word for wind. It simply means that Adam and Eve heard the Lord walking not through the garden, but into the garden, and he was preceded by a wind. Nothing new here about God. As God is entering the garden, wind precedes him, begins to blow, a cool breeze. You've heard some of our other denomination uh, theology about the 
blowing of the wind coming in. The cool breeze is what is called the, the wind of God. It is true. When you see God coming, you know God is coming because of the wind that precedes him. With Job, he comes with a whirlwind, with a tornado, a cyclone. With the speaking, with the day of Pentecost, uh, there in the upper room, inside the room, he comes like a mighty rushing wind. Wind. This, he's not, God is not, the Lord God is not walking through the garden. <laughs> He's walking into the garden and he's preceded by the wind. How do we know that? We read the next verse. <clears throat> I'm sorry. We read the next verse and it says, <clears throat> And the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Why did they not run to the Lord? Because they had sinned. The very person they should have run to. But no, they got to hide. So the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? That's not exactly what he said. That is an English translation. Thank you, William Tyndale. That makes it sound, Where are you? That makes it sound like God is not all-knowing and he doesn't know where they are. Where are you? Ollie, ollie out and free. Come on out. Where are you? No, that's not what it says. The actual word there is the word to utter. Uh, it's a two words in the Hebrew, and it says, where, speak, or where, utter. In other words, the Hebrew picture is, from where you are, speak to me. They don't have to come out of their hiding place to speak to God, because He can hear them. The saddest thing in all my life is to hear a person when I've asked them, would you like to ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior right now? And when they say to me, there's some things in my life that I've got to get straightened out before I do that. Now, I want to do it, but I've got to get some things fixed. No, you don't. From where you are, you can speak and God can hear you. You don't have to get anything fixed. Adam and Eve didn't have to go anywhere. From where they were hiding in the trees, they could speak and God knew what was going on. In fact, from hiding in the trees, they say, <clears throat> Adam said, I heard the sound of thee, the sound. What sound? The wind. I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Huh. What does being afraid have to do with being naked? Because he had sinned. Exactly, that is true. Actually, nothing is any, they don't have anything to do with it, if you really want to know. They've sinned, so they're afraid. They've sinned because now they realize that the moment they bit of that fruit, the instinct of knowing the difference between good and evil was turned on. Did they know evil a moment before they took a bite? No. But now that one bite has turned on that instinct and they now know. What do they know? They know the differences between being a Ish or an Isha. They have finally realized they have come out of their innocence by now knowing the difference between boys and girls. Folks, preschool teachers in here? Any preschool teachers in here? We don't have any preschool teachers here? Any ex preschool teachers? Good, ex preschool teacher. Good. Do we have male and female bathrooms in preschool? Do we now? Well, we used to, didn't. In fact, in our preschool that we had for 30 years, there, there's the bathroom and there were the potties and the everything, and you just did it, and they never noticed the innocence. Okay? The couple's not innocent any longer. They have noticed their differences and they have sought to cover up their differences as best they can. Could someone have told them that they were naked? Mm, yeah, they could have. Yeah. It would have been best if they'd have remained like they were before, but that was not part of God's plan. Had it not had it been part of not part of God's plan, had it been part of God's plan for them to be that way, he never would have planted that tree in the garden in the first place. 
And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? He knows the answer to that. He knows it. Could someone have told Adam and Eve about being naked? Yes. The angels could have told them. Absolutely. The demons could have come and told them. Absolutely. But that's not what happened. No. God knew. God's now asking them a question so that they have to respond. Now I want you to notice three sins, two sins have already happened in Adam's life and one sin has happened in Eve's life and I bet you hadn't caught the two of Adam yet. We're fixing to add two more to Adam's sin. And the man said, and here's where he sins two more times, The woman whom thou gavest to me to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. The woman you gave me, had you not given me that woman, I wouldn't be in this predicament. This is your fault, God. It's the woman you gave me. And then she is the one who gave me the fruit, so I ate it. Okay, four sins of Adam thus, so far. You catch them? Number one. He ate of the tree he was told not to eat of. Number two, he hid from the Lord God instead of running to the Lord God for forgiveness. Number three, he blamed God on giving him his wife that it was his fault. Number four, he blamed the wife that she's the one that brought it to him. Four sins. Boom, boom, boom. Imagine if we look, we can find a couple more, but that's suffice for right now. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? That's kind of interesting. Because if you take the word this out of this, the word what in the Hebrew is translated, the Hebrew word is translated what as many times as it's translated why. Okay? In Tyndale's day, when you wanted to know why something was done, you didn't use the word why. You said, what is this that you have done? Okay? We want to know why you did it, not what the definition was. Don't tell me what you've done. God knew what you had done. What he's asking is, is why have you done this? And that's because that word this is in that, in, that par- in that phrase right there, in that sentence. And so the Lord wants to know, what is this that you have done? Why have you done this, Eve? Now listen to what Eve's response is. And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now I want you to watch something. Eve was deceived by the serpent, and she sinned by eating of the fruit. She sinned by blaming the serpent, but she accepted responsibility for eating it. Not so bad. Adam has sinned four times. Eve has sinned twice. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, And more than every beast of the field, in all your belly you shall go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. He's already been going on his belly. He's already been eating the dust. He didn't have legs. He was made a serpent. One of the definitions of being a serpent was you slithered on your belly. What's the deal here? The deal is found in the word curse. We skip over it. Most commentators do skip over it. The word curse means that people will curse you. People will speak disdain about you. People will speak ill of you. In other words, from this day forward, that serpent, when he is seen by humans, will be spoken of, spoken from their mouth with disdain. You got it? Because you have to go to the action. And the action's in the word curse. Yes, ma'am. Well, you have to remember, and by the way, this is in the notes. I hadn't said it yet, so I'm saying it now. This is a reminder in the serpent. All serpents, all snakes, are now going to forever be a reminder of this sinful event that occurred. Now, do you like snakes? Do you have a problem with snakes? Okay. Does anybody in here just love snakes? A dead snake is a good snake, okay? So in other words, the prophecy of the Lord to the snake has come true. When you see the snake, you think, Ugh. All right? Yes, ma'am. Who loves snakes? 
we'll talk later. You didn't at one time. You had to get used to them. Yeah. Verse 15. And I will put enmity. What is enmity? Think about hostility. Between you and the woman. Snake, I'm going to put hostility between you and the woman. Supports the verse before. Got it? And between your seed, that means all the offspring of the seeds of the snake. Seed. The offsprings. The ones that we already and still have today because of the beginning of these snakes. Got it? Okay. And he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. He shall bruise you on the head and he shall bru- and you shall bruise him on the head. Now hang on a second. I want you to see something. Who is the he? The snake, you're right. We get that wrong a lot of times. We think that's the Lord. Okay, but here's the snake. Shall bruise her on the head. But the woman is going to bruise him. Who's the him there? The snake on the heel. Well, the snake is going to be a sign for all generations to come on his seed and Eve's seed, her descendants, about the event that just took place when she was deceived. Now, Scripture is wonderful because Paul in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, explains this to us. He says, And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, and you, the woman, shall bruise him on the head. He is, Satan is going to be, this serpent is going to be bruised by the seed of, of, of Eve, that will be Jesus Christ one day, is going to crush him under. The woman's penalty. To the woman he said, now, now hang on a second, before I go, so I can go quickly. Verse, thir- verse 15, you see the word seed after the, the serpent, and after the, talking about the serpent, and seed after the woman. In other words, he's talking about generations to come in that. Now there's a new thought going on. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Is that a prophecy to all the coming seed of the woman, or is that a prophecy just to Eve? It is a prophecy just to Eve. Because we all know about childbirth, and it was all planned. But this is about Eve. This is not about her seed. Had it been about her seed, he would have included that like he did up above. This is a curse on Eve that she is going to be greatly multiplied and increased in her childbearing pain above what women were supposed to have the pain. Still going to have pain in childbirth. We understand that. But hers is going to be greater. And the verse right here that says, In pain you shall bring forth children That's not the proper translation. The Hebrew actually says, In pain you shall bring forth a son. Not children. A son. A male child. So we're about to see in the next lesson that Adam and Eve are going to have a relationship and she is going to bear a son. And that son is going to bring incredible grief to Eve. Especially when she has her second son by the name of Abel and her first son kills her second son. And who is she going to run to for security and for a loving kindness? She's going to run to Adam, her husband. And Adam is going to rule over her. What is Adam's penalty? Then to Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I have commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you shall eat of the plants of the fields. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, Adam's penalty is he's not going to any longer have the freedom to just go pluck a piece of food from any place that he desires. He is going to have to work for it now. That is the curse that is brought 
on Adam. Life's necessities will no longer be provided. It's going to be a different life when he is taken away from the tree of life. Verse 20. Now the man called his wife Eve, wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Well, when he's going to see her give birth, he, the word Eve means life giver. And when she gives birth, that is when he is probably going to name her, when he sees that son born from her body. Now, verse 21. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and for his wife and clothed them. The penalties for sin, for the sins of all the participants, have been instilled. But the remedy, the remedy has not. Fig leaves do not last long enough. And God wanted something a little more permanent to remind them of what they had done. To remind them. So the Lord God took the skins of animals and he properly tanned them and he created them. He fixed them to where they would last. And he clothed Adam and Eve with those clothes that covered the parts of them that were different. All across the world, if you go to Africa, if you go to any place, especially in the places that are very um, hot, the tribal people who have never heard the word of God or anything like that, instinctively know and they take and cover their private parts, their different parts between Ish and Isha. They cover them. Why? Because they instinctively know also. It's the way God has created all the descendants. So God made those coverings and he put them on there. Why do humans wear clothing to this day? We wear them because they are a reminder of our differences. God's going to give some specific instruction on down about the type of clothing that we are supposed to wear. The difference between men and women, but that comes later. Verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. It is true. The old serpent snake knew exactly what he was saying. He knew because he had been in God's presence. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have asked this question. And made this statement. He's become like us because he knows the difference between good and evil. Because he's eaten of the tree that we placed there. Lest he stretch out his hand and take from the tree of, the tree of life and eat and live forever. Had Adam and Eve been able to get to the tree of life after they had sinned and taken a bite, taken the fruit and began to eat and eat on a regular basis, they would live forever. They would live forever. But that was not part of God's plan. So, therefore, the Lord sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the land from which he was taken. So they take Adam. They move him away to the east. And we know that because in verse 24 it says, So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim, and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Cherubim, that is not one angel. The single of cherub, the single of one angel is the word cherub. The word cherub, cherubim means several angels were placed there to guard with a flaming sword that protects the way to the guard to the tree of life. By the way, this tree of life does not disappear. This tree of life is not done away with. In the very last chapter of the book of Revelation, the tree of life comes back into our view for us to eat of to be part of our eternity. So, what happens here? Just a moment, please. Just a moment. What happens here, a flaming sword is put there to protect it. To protect the way to the tree. Not the way to the garden, but the way to the tree. What is hidden from us? The tree. Not the garden. We do not know where the garden is. But the garden probably doesn't look any different than anything else that's in its area. But the tree has been hidden from us. 
Yes. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time to study your word. Oh, how we love you. In your name, amen and amen. amen. By the way, I have two extra fig leaves if any of you want to go home and use them. <laughs> Try them on for size.